Okay. Hey, good morning. So we're just a little earlier than normal today. Um, we are going to be going through Isaiah 28 through 30. Um, Tuesdays are going to be normally early, but actually tomorrow is going to be early too. So we're just having a bunch of early days. Yay! Yay for early days. Well, uh, it's a good thing. It is a good thing. I didn't want to miss being in the Word with you, and I have to leave early, so here you go. Um, we are going to go ahead and get started in Isaiah, but let's go ahead and pray first. Lord, I just thank you for this morning. I thank you for your Word. <sighs> thank you for the ability to be up early. Thank you for coffee. <laughs> And Lord, thank you for my husband and his job. Thank you for um, Mom Linda and her improved health. Lord, I just pray that you would just continue to guide and direct all of us as we do the things that we're doing. And I pray that you would just bless this time that we're in your word. Guide and direct us. Show me what um, you're trying to speak to me and help me to be who I, you've called me to be in Jesus' name. Amen. I thought I turned this off, but I guess I didn't. So there you go. Okay. We are again in Isaiah 28, and we are in verse 14. My hair is a little wet. Okay. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, you scoffers who rule this people in Jerusalem, because you have said, we have made a covenant with death. And with Sheol we have an agreement. When the overwhelming whip passes through, it will not come to us. For we have made lies our refuge and in falsehood we have taken shelter so that's never good to make an agreement with Sheol to make lies your refuge falsehood your shelter those things of course will not stand and my hair's popping out those things won't stand those things are like shifting sand those things are the things that will cause you to stumble and fall oh gosh coconut oil Coconut oil is the best, but when it's like in its full form, like it loves to just sit in your hair. Okay, stay focused. Here we go. Um, so therefore, thus says the Lord God, verse 16. Behold, I am the one who has laid as a foundation in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not be in haste. And I will make justice the line and righteousness the plumb line. And hail will sweep away the refuge of lies. The waters will overwhelm the shelter. Then your covenant with death will be annulled. And your agreement with Sheol will not stand. When the overwhelming scourge passes through, you will be beaten down by it. I don't know about you, but that's not a place I want to be. As often as it passes through, it will take you. By For morning by morning, it will pass through. By day and by night, and it will be a sh be sheer terror to understand the message. For the bed is too short to stretch on. For the bed is too short to stretch oneself on, and the covering too narrow to wrap oneself in. For the Lord will rise up as on Mount Perizim, as in the valley of Gibeon, he will be roused to do his deed. Strange is his deed, and to work his work, alien is his work. Now therefore do not scoff, lest your bonds be made strong. For I have heard a decree of the destruction from the Lord God of hosts against the whole land. So again, the book of Isaiah, Isaiah is a prophet. He's um, sent by God to talk to the people from what God is telling him to say. And he's telling the people, you know, we're going to be judged. We're going to be judged for these things that we're doing that are against God. And don't try and say that we're not. Don't try and scoff or make a big, not make a big deal about it because God said he's going to do it and he's going to do what he says he's going to do, right? So give ear and hear my voice. Give attention and hear my speech. Does he who plows for sowing plow continually? Does he continually open and harrow his ground? When he has leveled its surface, does he not scatter dill or sow cumin and put in wheat and rows and barley in its proper place and emmer as the border? For he is rightly instructed, his God teaches him. So there's a time and a season for everything. You know, he, 
you don't just continually plow up the ground. You plow up the ground so you can plant and grow things and produce, right? Dill is not threshed with a threshing sledge, nor is a cart <laughs> nor is a cart wheel rolled over cumin. But dill is beaten out with a stick and cumin with a rod. Does one crush grain for bread? No, he does not thresh it forever. When he drives his cart wheel over it with his horses, he does not crush it. This also comes from the Lord of hosts. He is wonderful in counsel and excellent in wisdom. So he's telling the people, you know, there's a time and season for everything. Everything is going to happen the way it's supposed to happen. And God has given this direction that this is going to happen the way he's saying. So let's believe what he says. Let's trust that he's going to do what he says he's going to do. And let's prepare and try to change maybe even the situation by by changing our hearts and minds now, right? But that's not where they were at. The siege of Jerusalem. Ah, uh, Ariel, Ariel, the city where David encamped, and year to year let the feast run their round. Yet I will distress Ariel, and there shall be moaning and lamentation, and she shall be to me like an Ariel. I don't, I don't know what an Ariel is. An Ariel is could mean lion of God or hero or altar hearth. Okay, that's weird. And I will encamp against you all around and will besiege you with towers and I will raise siege works against you and you will be brought low from the earth you shall speak and from the dust your speech will be bowed down. Your voice shall come from the ground like the voice of a ghost and the dust your speech shall whisper. So... There's judgment coming from for Ariel. But the multitude of your foreign foes shall be like small dust, and the multitude of ruthless sh like passing chaff. And in an instant, suddenly, you will be visited by the Lord of hosts with thunder and with earthquake and with great noise, with whirlwind and tempest and the flame of a devouring fire. And the multitude of all the nations that fight against Ariel, all that fight against her and her stronghold, and distress her shall be like a dream, a vision of the night. As when a hungry man dreams he is eating and awakes with his hunger not satisfied, or as when a thirsty man dreams he is drinking and awakes faint with his thirst not quenched, so shall the multitude of all the nations be that fight against Mount Zion. Astonish yourselves and be astonished. Blind yourselves and be blind. Be drunk but not with wine, stagger but not with strong drink. For the Lord has poured out upon you a spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes, the eyes of the prophets, and covered your heads, the seers. And you might be like, what does that have to do with anything? Well, Isaiah is trying to prepare their hearts. These things are going to come upon them because of where and what they have done. And... They can't get out of these situations, but they can be prepared for the situation. So when the situation comes, it's not like, oh my gosh, what is this that's happening to me? But it's like, yeah, God said this is going to happen to me. See? See the difference? And the vision of all this become to you like the words of a book that is sealed. When men give it to one who can read, saying, read this, he says, I cannot, for it is sealed. And when they give the book to one who cannot read, saying, read this, he says, I cannot read. So do you see the same situation happens in both cases? This this is this what's this that is happening is the same for those that can read, but it is sealed, and those that cannot read because they cannot read. There's nothing you do about it. There's nothing you can see. You can't get past the fact that the situation is gonna happen. It's gonna happen whether or not you understand or believe it, and Prepare your hearts, prepare your minds so that when you're in the situation, when the situation comes to you, God has already told you that it would. God has prepared you. God has gone before you. God comes alongside you. God is behind you. God is there with you in and through the situation to know that there is hope. 
And the Lord said, because this people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips while their hearts are far from me, their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. Therefore, behold, I will again do wonderful things for this people with wonder upon wonder and the wisdom of their wise men shall perish and the discernment of their discerning men shall be hidden. So it's like Isaiah is telling the people these things are going to happen, but they don't get it. They don't get it, even though they can see they're unseen. Even though they can hear, they're unhearing. Even though they they understand and they hear and they, they're doing stuff, their hearts are still wrong. It doesn't matter what you do if your heart is in the wrong place. You know, it's not enough to have a relationship with God if you're just doing stuff. That's not a relationship. That's servitude. And God doesn't want a servant God wants you to be his child, right? So, ah, you who hide deep from the Lord your counsel, whose deeds are in the dark and who say, who sees us? Who knows us? You turn things upside down. Shall the potter be regarded as the clay that the thing made should say of its maker, he did not make me? And man, we, we do that today, right? We do that today in that we... We, we choose to not acknowledge that God is God and that we are not. We want to prove our worth and prove who we are and make ourselves out better and more than we, we really are. And, and God is just trying to tell us, yeah, you're the creation. You are what was made. I am the maker. But we, we try to act like that's not true. Um. Or the thing forms say of him who formed him, he has no understanding. Is it not yet a very little while until Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field? And the fruitful field shall be regarded as a forest. In that day, the deaf shall hear the words of a book and out of their gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind shall see. The meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord, and the poor among mankind shall exult in the Holy One of Israel. For the ruthless shall come to nothing, and the scoffer cease, and all who watch to do evil shall be cut off. Who by a word can make who by a word make a man out to be an offender, and lay a snare for him who reproves in the gate, and with an empty plea turn aside him who is in the right? Therefore, Thus says the Lord, who redeemed Abraham. Concerning the house of Jacob, Jacob shall no more be ashamed. No more shall his face grow pale. For when he sees his children, the work of my hands in the midst, they will sanctify my name. They will sanctify the Holy One of Jacob. They will stand in awe of the God of Israel. And those who go astray in spirit will come to understanding. And those who murmur will ins accept instruction. So God is trying to enlighten the people that even though you have turned away, even though your hearts are far from me, there will come a time when he sees his children, when they will come back to him and God will be there. God will not forsake them. God will be there for them when they come back. And God is there for us now today, right? He's, he's letting them know that, yes, you're going to go through these trials. You're going to come against oppression. These things are going to be hard. They're going to be difficult. But guess what? I've already been there because I'm telling you about them, right? And you're going to get, you're going to get through it. You're, you're not going to be stuck in this situation. God is going to see you through, right? So do not go down to Egypt. Now that's a picture of do not go down into the land that is against me. Don't, don't turn away from the one true God. Ah, stubborn children, declares the Lord, who carry out a plan, but not mine, and who make an alliance, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin, who set out to go to Egypt without asking for my direction. Is it wrong to go to Egypt? No. When Jesus was a child and Herod was seeking to kill all the baby boys because he wanted to kill Jesus, God told Joseph to take Mary and the baby and flee to Egypt. There are times when we go to Egypt. They were they went to Egypt when there was famine in the book in the Old Testament, Jacob and, and his sons, right? But to go to Egypt and not be told to go to Egypt means that you're fleeing and you're doing your own thing. 
And, and that's what the picture of going to Egypt means. It means that you're out of God's will if you're not going there with the direction of God, right? So, without asking in my direction, to take refuge in the protection of Pharaoh and to seek shelter in the shadow of Egypt. We shouldn't be seeking shelter in the shadow of Egypt unless God directs us to do so. Now, there are times that God directs us to do so, like I just said, but if you're going to try and find protection outside of God, don't ever step outside of God, right? Because God is the greatest protection that you could ever have. Don't step outside of that protection. You're not going to get more protection. You get less protection. Don't do that. Therefore shall the protection of Pharaoh turn to your shame and the shelter of the shadow of Egypt to your humiliation. For though his officials are at Zoan and his envoys reach Hanes, Everyone comes to shame, though a people that cannot profit them, that brings neither help nor profit, but shame and disgrace. An oracle on the beasts of the Negev. Through a land of trouble and anguish, from where to come the lioness and the lion, the adder and the flying fiery serpent, they carry their riches on the backs of donkeys and their treasures on the humps of camels, to a people that cannot profit them. Egypt's help is worthless and empty. Therefore, I have called her Rahab who sits still. Okay, that might not make any sense to anybody, but what God is trying to say is that Egypt's help is worthless and empty. Egypt's help is only helpful if God tells you to go there. If you're going there because God has directed you to go there, then that, that is where you need to be. But if you're going there in your own will, in your own desire to try and help and protect yourself, it's going to be worthless and empty. And Rahab who sits still would mean, because Rahab was the one that hid the spies in Jericho, and she saved her family by doing that, right? Now, if she would have sat still and not done what God had put on her heart to do, she would have not saved her family. They would have all been destroyed when Jericho was destroyed. But because she was obedient and because she rose up, and she, she acted in the time that was needed. She saved her family. So don't be Rahab who sits still. Be Rahab who acts. Don't, don't go to Egypt for help. Go to God, right? Okay, so Isaiah is still going on. And now we're talking about a rebellious people in verse 8. And now go, write it before them on a tablet and inscribe it in a book. That it may be for the time to come as a witness forever. For they are a rebellious people, lying children, children unwilling to hear the instruction of the Lord, who say to the seers, do not see, and to the prophets, do not prophesy to us what is right. Speak to us smooth things, prophesy illusions, leave the way, turn aside from the path, let us hear no more about the Holy One of Israel. Don't be this rebellious people, right? God is, God is telling Isaiah to tell the people, this is what a rebellious people look like. Don't be these people. And they hear it and it doesn't hit their heart. And they still become these rebellious people. And, but we know God is there and God is merciful and God is just and God has looked out for the people of Israel but this word is the same for us today. Don't be this rebellious people. Don't be the people that tell others, I don't want to, I don't want to hear what you have to say. I don't want to hear what's right. I, I want to hear things that I want to hear. Smooth things. That God is love and 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 peace and, and joy and mercy and hope. Well, yes, God is all those things. But God is righteous and God is fair and God is just and God is true. And you can't have one without the other. A just God doesn't allow hatred and murder to go unpunished. A, a just God doesn't allow rebellion without consequences, right? So hear what God's word is for you today, right? And don't take my word for it, ever. You should always search out the scriptures for yourself and see what God's word speaks to your heart and to your spirit because God's word is alive and powerful and God speaks to each and every one of us exactly where we're at. So 
There you go. So that's our Old Testament reading for today. And then that takes us into our New Testament reading. And we're in Galatians. Paul is speaking to the church of Galatia. Galatians 3.23 through 4.31. So now therefore faith came and we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So now before faith came, now before faith came, before faith came would be before Christ. We were held captive under the law. Captive meaning they only had the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments do not save you. Keeping the Ten Commandments do not give you passage into heaven. Keeping the Ten Commandments just showed you that you were a sinner in need of a savior. And imprisoned until the coming faith could be revealed, we were imprisoned in our own sins. Why? Because we had no savior. Jesus Christ had not yet come. So then the law was our guardian. The law, the Ten Commandments is what over, over, shadowed the people until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. So when Jesus Christ came, he offered us hope. Why? Because he said, you are not, you are no longer under the commandments, the 10 commandments. You are under the law, the, you are under faith. So the keeping of the 10 commandments doesn't save you. Faith saves you faith in you faith in Jesus Christ as the son of God and his two commandments were to love God and to love others which sums up the whole of the 10 commandments right so but now that faith has come we are no longer under a guardian we're no longer under the 10 commandments the 10 commandments and keeping of the 10 commandments is not what saves us what saves us is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, right? For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So when we are baptized into Christ, when we, ha we ask Jesus into our heart and we have a personal relationship with him, we put on Christ. We put on the Son of God, the righteous robes of Jesus Christ. So there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. So there is no favoritism. There is no racism. There is no sexism. There is no feminism. There is no religiosity. Everybody is one in Christ. It doesn't matter who, what, or where you came from. We are all equal in the eyes of God, right? Because he is our creator and we are his creation, right? So, and if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring. So when we come into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, we are no longer just ourselves. We become adopted children of God adopted children of Israel, adopted children under Abraham. That's why Abraham's descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore because his descendants were not just Isaac because he had only one son, but it was Isaac and Jacob and the 12 tribes and Jesus and the disciples and Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the outer reaches of the earth. And that's us, right? So heirs according to the promise. What's the promise? The Holy Spirit is the promise. The promised gift of the Holy Spirit. When we ask Jesus Christ into our life, the Holy Spirit dwells within us and we are able to live confident and rest assured in who and what Jesus Christ is and what he's doing in our lives and walking forward in that faith. That promise is the seal upon our hearts that we have eternal life and it starts the moment we ask Jesus Christ into our life and begin a relationship with him. So what does it mean to be sons and heirs? And of course, daughters as well. I mean, verse or chapter four of Galatians. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different than a slave, though he is in the own, though he is the owner of everything. Let's try again. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. 
So until you became a Christian, until you accepted Jesus Christ, until you understood your need for a savior, you were under the elementary principles of the world, which would be elementary spirits, which would be contrary to God, right? Because we were born sinners. You don't teach a child how to sin. They, they already know. They know how to lie. They know how to throw fit. They know how to steal. They know how to, they know how to do evil because we're all born sinners, right? Now, many people don't want to hear that. Many people want to say that children are born pure and holy and great, and it's society that messes them up. Not so much because God's word says we were all born sinners. None of us are without sin, right? We change when we become in a relationship with Jesus Christ, right? So, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, Jesus Christ, born of Mary, born under the law, okay? So the law, the Ten Commandments were in place when Jesus was born, right? Because he was a child, he was an infant, to redeem those who were under the law. So he was born under the law to redeem all humanity that is under the law, right? The Ten Commandments, so that we might receive adoption as sons. So he was born under the Ten Commandments to redeem all of us under the Ten Commandments because when we ask Jesus Christ into our hearts, when we have a personal relationship with him, we are no longer slaves, but sons, adopted sons and daughters of God. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. You are no longer a slave. We are not slaves to sin. We are adopted sons of God, sons and daughters of God. We are adopted children of God. We no longer have to do the things we don't want to do. We no longer have to be under the old habits and the addictions and, and the hatred and the evil and the ugliness of this world because we have a personal relationship with God. And in our weakness, we are made strong through Jesus Christ. So Paul's concern for the Galatians. So verse 8, formerly when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not God's. Before we knew who God was, there were things in our lives that we did and worshipped because we just thought that was what we needed to do. Before you had a relationship with God, you might have worshipped your job or worshipped your family. Or, and you might think, I don't worship those things. I don't have idols in my... Yeah, you had stuff in your life that was more important than a relationship with God. And if you have a relationship with God and there are things in your life that are more important than him, you need to check where your heart is, right? But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, we are known by God when we have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? You were slaves to sin. You were under the law. You were living in the death of addiction and, and, um, and the sin that you were in. But God is saying, you know, you're not there anymore. God is saying, you, you have, you've been given new life. I gave you new life. My hair is just not working with me today. So don't live the way you did before. Live for me. But we want to put, it's like being a prisoner in a prison and then you, they parole you, right? You're set free, okay? And, and instead of living free, you, you go back to that prison cell and you sit in the prison cell like you're in prison, but the door is open. What are you doing? Why are you going back to the prison that once held you with the door open because the door is open because you have a personal relationship with God, but we go back to the things that tripped us up before from to the things that separated us from God and God won't drag us out of the jail cell. If you want to be in the jail cell, he's going to let you be there. Why? Are, why? He ha 
He allows you to be there because he is a gentleman and he is going to let you do what you choose to do. But he's opened the door. You don't have to sit in the jail cell anymore. God has given you the freedom to have a personal relationship with him. But we get afraid and we get tired and we want the familiar of the box that held us. And God is saying, live free. Live for me. Step out. And stepping out and walking forward in faith with God can be scary because we don't know what the next step is. But we know who holds the next step. We know who does know Jesus Christ because he goes before us, right? So brothers, I entreat, oh, you observe, no, elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more. You observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid I may have labored over you in vain. Again, remember this is Paul speaking to the Galatian church and he's telling them, you know, you can keep the calendar. You keep months and seasons and years. You know how things are going to work. You know when to plant, when to harvest. You know when the, the festivals are. But you're lacking the vision to see that God is in this situation and God wants you to walk forward in faith and you're going back into the, the, the prisons that have held you before. Verse 12. Brothers, I entreat you, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You did me no wrong. You know it was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. And though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. Paul had an ailment. Paul had, um, he calls it a thorn in his flesh. People say maybe it was his vision because he was struck blind on the road to Damascus when he saw Jesus and maybe his vision never returned to him the way it should have. It talks about how he would write really, really big, which someone that couldn't see might do. Um, we don't know exactly what the thorn in this flesh is, but he, he mentions how he had prayed that it would be removed and it didn't because God wanted him to be strong in his weaknesses, that God wanted him to keep that. And he understood as time went on, that it kept him where he needed to be. You know, if he didn't have the thorn in his flesh, he might have thought that he was doing all he was doing for God in his own strength and power. But because he had this thorn in his flesh, he understood that it wasn't him, but it was God. And sometimes God allows things in our lives that we don't understand and we don't appreciate, but it's for our good and for our benefit and God has a hand in it and God has a reason and a purpose and a hope for it that he wants you to rely on him, to trust in him, to believe in him, to know that beyond a shadow of a doubt, he's in that thorn in your flesh to bring about a good and perfect situation in your life. Now that's not an easy thing to believe in when you're in the midst of your thorn in your flesh and I'm going to be the first to tell you I don't want the thorn in my flesh and I've had that God brought me to a point where I had that herniated disc and I was in so much pain and God brought me through that enough to realize that I appreciate each and every day because there were moments in time when I couldn't move but the fact that I can the fact that I share now the fact that I understand that every day is a gift and that nothing can be taken for granted because I don't know if I have the rest of this day. That I can use every moment of time that I have to his honor and glory. And that's what my purpose is. So don't question what your purpose is. Your purpose is to give God honor and glory with every moment of day and night or whatever you have to do so, right? So when then, no. And though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. So they didn't despise Paul because of his thorn. They accepted him as an angel of God. Not a true angel with the wings, but as a messenger from God. Verse 15. What then has become of the blessing you felt? For I testify to you that if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. Have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? And that's another one that people think um, it was his vision because they say that about his eyes. So verse 17, they make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you up that you may 
make much of them. It is always good to be made much of for a good purpose. And not only when I am present with you, my little children, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you, I wish I could be present with you now and change my tone for I am perplexed about it. So Paul is upset because they're falling away from the faith and he wants them to stand firm in, in God. So the example of Hagar and Sarah. Verse 21, tell me you who desire to be under the law, who do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through the promise. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the labor, for the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. And that's God's promise. That's God's promise because they chose to do what they did and Hagar had a child, but that child wasn't God's best for them. And that's why God continued to work with them and Sarah bore Isaac, the chosen one of Israel, right? Verse 28. Now you brothers like Isaac are children of promise. We are the children of promise. But just as that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born so also it is now sorry internet went out but what does the scripture say cast out the slave and her son for the son of a slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman we can't do the things that we did before we were saved along with the things that we do while we're saved so brothers we are not children of the slave but of the free woman. We can't act according to the way we acted before we knew who Jesus Christ was. We can't continue to do the things that are sin in our lives and be saved. You, you can't live as a free person. Live according to what God has put in your heart. Okay, so Psalm 62. My soul waits for God alone to the choir master according to, Jed, to Jeduthun. This is another Psalm of David. For God alone my soul waits in silence. For him comes my from him comes my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress, I shall not be greatly shaken. How long will all of you attack a man to batter him? Like a leaning wall, a tottering fence. They only plan to thrust him down from his high position. They take pleasure in falsehood, they bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse. Don't say and do and think that God knows that your heart doesn't belong to him. God wants you to live for him with your heart, your mind, and your whole body, not just with words and deeds, right? Your heart needs to go for God. For God alone, O oh my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory, my mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. Take a moment, think about that. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Is God your refuge? Do you pour out your heart to him? Do you trust him at all times? Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances they go up, they are together lighter than a breath. Put no trust in extortion. Set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart on them. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God. And that to you, O Lord, belongs steadfast love. For you will render a man according to his work. God will hear. God will understand. God knows your heart. Don't try and pretend to be something you're not. God loves you and wants relationship with you. It doesn't want just lip service, but he wants your heart as well. Okay, so that finishes up 
our Psalms reading, and now we're in Proverbs, Proverbs 29, 19-21. Oh, sorry, Proverbs 23, 19-21. Hear, my son, and be wise, and direct your heart in the way. Be not among drunkards, or among gluttonous eaters of meat. For the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty, and slumber with will clothe them with rags. So, be wise, direct your heart in the way. Direct, Be wise and direct your heart according to what God's will is, right? Be in the word so you know what his will is. Don't be a drunkard. Don't be gluttonous eater of meat. Does it say you can't have a drink? No. Does it say you can't eat meat? No. It says don't get drunk. Don't let the wine overcome you to where you are not in your right senses. Don't eat meat to the point of gluttony. God is telling us not to allow things to become more important than him, right? Because when you do, you will have poverty. You will not you will not have riches and glory and success that God wants for you because you will be worshiping the idols that you've created for yourself. And you won't have the righteous robes of Christ to be robed in because you will be clothed in rags. God has a plan and a purpose that is far greater than you could possibly imagine if you have a relationship with him, if you're walking in faith, if, you're, if you love God and you love others, you will accomplish the purpose God has for your life. That is your purpose. That is your calling. Love God, love others. It's, it's a very simple purpose. Does that mean everybody's purpose is the same? No, because everybody is not in the same place. So wherever you're at, if you're loving God and you're loving others, then you're accomplishing the purpose God has for your life, period. It, it's not rocket science. It requires faith. And that might be harder than rocket science because rocket science can be proven and written and shown in words and things. But to have faith, requires you to walk forward not knowing but trusting and having hope in the God of the universe, right? Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you have an excellent day. Um, I will look forward to seeing you tomorrow again early because I have another early day tomorrow. Um, but again, catch me whenever you can. Thank you so much. Uh, please like, please share. God bless.